Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. This is one of over a thousand programs we've done since the pandemic began, where we live stream an author uh, from wherever they are in the world uh, to you about their book. Today we have Jeffrey Rosen, uh, the CEO and President of the National Constitution Center, also a professor of law at George Washington uh, Law School in uh, Washington, D.C., and writer for The Atlantic, right? Several other things like that. So, Jeffrey, you're the author of this new book, The Pursuit of Happiness, What Classical Writers on Virtue, How They Influenced the, the Lives of the Founders. Um, and it's fascinating because you really take us back into a totally different culture. You know, we kind of think this is an American culture, that, that this is what started, but I, I think it just sounds like a totally different culture. And it doesn't even sound like my dad's culture when, when these things were studied. Um, but it's about, I think one of the things to say is that it was the culture of a relatively small percentage of the population in the colonies. It was, I mean, it was the leadership of the colonies, but, but you, you have a very interesting statistic about one book uh, by a preacher. You said that half of all the college students in the country read this book between 1743 and 1776, influencing an entire generation. Um, but how many college students were there? How many people are we talking? Are we talking about a thousand, or are we talking about ten thousand? I don't know how many college students there were, but I don't at all think that this uh, basic wisdom was limited to college students. The most extraordinary thing about this project was that I learned that the ancient definition of the pursuit of happiness as being good rather than feeling good, as pursuing virtue rather than pleasure, persisted from the time of the Greeks and Romans all the way up to the Enlightenment through the American Revolution, and then was picked up in the 19th century by people like Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, who got it out of the McGuffey Reader and the Columbian Orator, which Douglass paid for in bread on the streets of Baltimore. It went in public schools to great Americans like Louis Brandeis and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who told me that she got it from her mother. And it basically was the core curriculum of all American students until about 1950, and then it just dropped out of the culture. So the fascinating thing is how and why our understanding of happiness was transformed, as you just suggested, mm -hmm. uh, from, from being good to feeling good, let it all hang out, you do you. all. It's, it's a completely different worldview, as you suggest. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and it's just, uh, it, it, and, it, and it just dropped out of the culture. And, and, and we can talk about the question why, but I really want to emphasize this is not at all um, some uh, elite curriculum that's limited to the well-educated. It inspired the great black poet, Phyllis Wheatley, the first mm -hmm. uh, published black poet in America to write uh, poems of virtue that made her an international celebrity. Uh, black abolitionists invoked it to fight slavery and to uh, amend the constitution. This was basically what people understood as happiness for most of our history. And just to repeat what it is, um, rather than pursuing pleasure, it's mm. self-mastery, self-reliance, character improvement, being your best self so that you can serve others and cultivating your faculties of reason to moderate and temper your unreasonable passions and emotions so that you can achieve the strong, calm tranquility that really defines self-mastery. So it, it, it was ju it's just an amazing project. I, I fell on this uh, reading list uh, coincidentally we can talk about uh, that if you like but it yep. transformed my understanding both of um how to be a good person and also how to be a good citizen yeah it's it's interesting because the pursuit of happiness this phrase from the from the uh, declaration is very obvious very taken in, in stride um but but misused uh, people don't understand what what was meant by it um and how crucial the difference is in, in whether our society holds together or doesn't hold together. And that's why the founders, we'll, we'll go into this a little bit later, that the founders started to despair. Will the people not catch on to this idea? Um, so let's talk about the pursuit of happiness. What, what was also interesting, sorry, what was also interesting was that so many of the founders read internationally from so many different cultures about things that then also disappeared. People didn't, didn't really, 
the what most astounding thing to me in, in your book was that John Adams was a big fan of the Bhagavad Gita. You know, that just, <laughs> last thing I would have guessed. I'm so glad you uh, were struck by that. I was too, it just, it blew my mind. And he's yeah. so excited. He's writing to Jefferson as an old man, and he wants to know whether Joseph Priestley has lived long enough to translate the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. And Jefferson's good news, uh, he lived, and I'll, I'll send you the book. And Adams is convinced that this translation will show that Pythagoras, the founder of Greek moral philosophy, traveled in the East and learned from the Hindu masters. And he accurately saw a connection between the East and Western wisdom traditions that Emerson famously encapsulated in mm -hmm. his idea of the oversoul in the 19th century. It's inspiring to see how broadly the founders read, how, how industrious they were at keeping up this broad reading until the end, and really how ecumenical and, and non-sectarian their faith was. M many were Christians and, and were rooted in the text of the Bible, but they also noted that um, the Christian and civic Republican and legal and uh, other sources that used the phrase the pursuit of happiness all cited back to the classics and they, and they were so struck by the fact that Locke and Cicero and and Samuel Johnson the American and, and the, the, the Christian preachers all go back to Cicero's understanding of happiness as tranquility of mind and this has much in common as Adam said with the Eastern traditions that say we are what we think life is shaped by the mind as the Bhagavad Gita mm -hmm. says or uh, as um, the, the wisdom to avoid, to abandon attachment to externals, as the Stoics um, put it, is so similar to the advice of the Bhagavad Gita itself, which says, once you renounce attachment to external events, you can connect to the eternal self and all. Gandhi mm -hmm. summed that up, renounce and enjoy. It is, it's, it's, it, it both transforms our understanding of the pursuit of happiness and also of the of the spirituality of the founders to, to, to see how open many of them were to the traditions of the East as well as the West. And I, to go back to Adam for a second, um, you know, you, you think of this as starting with Emerson in America that finally, finally this came across. I mean, obviously there were different thinkers in Europe at different times going back, all of which paid attention and, and many people call themselves Pythagoreans. Galileo did, Copernicus did, et cetera, et cetera. But, to think of one of our presidents like Adams with the kind of prickly personality that he has, not just to have known about it, but then to have said, what strikes me is that this idea about in the, in the Bhagavad Gita about merging with an omniscient mind reminds me of the pursuit of perfection in ancient Greek philosophy. And you think almost nobody today even makes that connection. It's a brilliant connection. And I mean, I, I, I've run across it before, but. I wasn't expecting one of the presidents or the founders to pay any attention to such things. You're so right. Yeah. And his son, John Quincy Adams, who's mm -hmm. another deep reader and also reads Cicero in the original to mm -hmm. inspire and console himself, um, draws deep connections between Cicero and the Bible and writes sonnets of self-mastery um, after waking up in the White House to watch the sunrise. And um, Jefferson, of course, uh, at the end of his life, he starts as having been moved by the same Cicero passage that John Quincy Adams invoked as his motto. And then at the end of his life, he says, I've thought about it, and I'm actually an Epicurean. I believe that the contraction of rational desires is better than trying to overcome desire entirely. They're just deep readers. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you can call them intellectuals or, or what, 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 what have you, but they were constant, and, and they read broadly. Mm -hmm. And and as you say, they... they, they um, um, insisted that literature and history, as well as moral philosophy and ethics and religion, all could inform our understanding of a deep life. The, 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 pro the project was inspired, as I mentioned in the book, by uh, my coming across Thomas Jefferson's reading list. Mm -hmm. He would speak to you know, sons of friends who were going to law school or anyone who wrote to him in his old age and said, what does it mean to be an educated person? And he has this kind of Stakhanovite reading schedule where you have to wake up before dawn and start mm -hmm. with philosophy and uh, political science, which is tougher. And then before lunch, you can have some history. And by the afternoon, you slowly move to literature and uh, poetry in the in the evening. Uh, I and and his 
the, the list has long selections from, for example, uh, literature. He thought the, the novels of Lawrence Stern were among the great moral instructors. Mm -hmm. um, but I was drawn to the section on religion. And it's sometimes he called it ethics and sometimes he called it religion. And I, um, I, I, was, I was drawn to it, just to tell the story, if I may, mm -hmm. by, by the fact that Jefferson, when asked what the meaning of happiness was, would send out a passage from a book by Cicero called The Tusculan Disputations. Mm -hmm. And it essentially said that he who is tranquil in mind and is self-mastered, he is the happy man of whom we are in quest. I was struck because Jefferson um, used that as a motto for a list of 13 virtues that he drafted and would send to his daughter about how to behave. And I knew about um, 13 virtues through Benjamin Franklin, who had made right. a similar list of, of 13 virtues for daily living. What struck me during COVID is that Franklin, like Jefferson, chose as a motto for his project this this passage from the Tusculan Disputations. So I basically thought I got to read this the Cicero book, and and what else to read? And when I came across Jefferson's reading list, which included the the Cicero book in the ethics section, what struck me most powerfully is that I'd never read or really heard of many of these books. And I've had a wonderful liberal arts education. I'm so grateful to my incredible teachers um, of history and literature and political philosophy and law, but it's these books of moral philosophy that just fell out of the curriculum for the mm -hmm. reasons we, we discussed. So I thought during COVID, I'll just start by reading the, the 10 books of moral philosophy on Jefferson's reading list. Some ancient philosophers, uh, Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus and Seneca, and some enlightenment philosophers like Locke and Hutchison and Keynes from mm -hmm. the Scottish Enlightenment. And then, just to continue the excitement of this reading project, what, what I learned just came as a revelation. Many of these books contain the phrase, the pursuit of happiness. You mm -hmm. can find this by electronic word searches and all uh, define happiness as, as virtue, as self-mastery. And then many of the sources also, the, the later ones, cite back to Cicero in the same definition of happiness. So it's, it's not some secret code that is a contested reading. It's just hiding in plain sight. If, if all of the sources mm -hmm embrace the same idea but it's just I, you know in addition to the ha the definition of happiness changes it's so fascinating that these ancient works of moral philosophy just were not in the curriculum when i was in high school and college mm -hmm. in the 1980s it was uh, it were great schools and i read all sorts of great books but but this particular uh discipline just fell out of the curriculum yeah you there's a story about John Adams that I want you to tell. Uh, when his parents were having a fight and how he, how he settled his mind, it just seems so unlikely that any 16-year-old would do this today. <laughs> what would you do if your parents are fighting in the other room, they're having a huge domestic dispute about whether or not a, 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 a domestic servant who'd originally been uh, enslaved uh, could stay with them or not after she'd been freed and, and you know, they were disagreeing about whether or not she should stay in the house. And Adams is really upset because his parents are really going at it. So he goes in the other room and he reads Cicero to console himself. And it's so, you know, it's just that you can't make this stuff up because the, the Cicero passages that he's reading are from Cicero's manual on grief. And that's the same book that Jefferson says is the core meaning of happiness. So for the ancients to understand happiness and tranquility, you have to understand how to deal with, with grief. Mm -hmm. And that's by abandoning any attempt to control the behavior of others. It's really good advice, of course, very hard yeah. to practice. But, <laughs> you know, rather than trying to stop his parents from fighting or worrying if they're gonna have more serious problems, he's gonna control the only thing he can control, which is, on, which is his own thoughts. Yeah, um, excellent advice that has also slipped out of the, uh, the, the culture. Um, <laughs> yes. So, it, it's interesting if we, let's go back to Ben Franklin now, since he, he's the oldest of the founders and you, you, you cover six kind of founders uh, the most, you cover a lot of other things too, uh, other characters. But let's talk about Ben Franklin. I, I don't know if you're aware, but there's something called Ben Franklin's Circles. It's a, it's a club in, in, started in New York and they, they have spread across the country. Um, and what they do is they, they pick one of the 13 things and try to practice it for a month and come back and tell people in the group how have they done for the month. So it's, it's really a substitute for spiritual improvement, you know, like a club. And uh, 
Yeah, it's interesting because it's the same 13 things you're talking about. That's marvelous. It's great that people are practicing the 13 virtues through clubs. And I know about this system because I practiced it in a with a friend of mine. Uh, we were a small club of two, mm-hmm. and a local rabbi in our synagogue in, in Washington, D.C., suggested that we try this system of character improvement called Musar, which means character in Hebrew. Mm-hmm. And there were the 13 virtues, and every night you put an X mark next to the virtue that you're working on for the week where you've fallen short. We tried it for a while. We actually found it incredibly depressing because there's so many. (laughs) Just kind of give it up after a while because it's so daunting. But we felt like we'd improved as a result, much as Franklin did. He he also gave it up after a while, but felt he was improved for having tried. What the 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 kind of incredible cross cultural connection is. uh, a, A Hasidic rabbi in 1808 got it from a Polish count. Um, who admired Franklin. And basically, the guy just got Franklin's autobiography and translated it into Hebrew. So it's it was the Hebrew version of Franklin's 13 virtues. We didn't know that when we started practicing it, yeah. but it's the exact same system. And it's it's and Franklin, of course, as he says in his autobiography, was inspired by Pythagoras, who has 76 golden verses, and they include, among other aphorisms, daily self-examination, the idea that um, virtue is a matter of daily or hourly habits and the only way to improve your habits is to be mindful about them so pythagoras recommends before you go to sleep you should just make a a mental checklist of how you've done against a series of uh, emotional virtues and um that's what franklin famously codified and that's what the hebrew rabbi translated into hebrew it's interesting because that that process is a little bit like canceling yourself you know, I mean, if you, huh. <laughs> you, you and and I think your your approach to the to the founders is not the usual, um, but very useful to say, well, this is what they tried. They were trying to accomplish this. They all felt short. They fell very seriously short and they were hypocritical like Jefferson on on, on uh, slavery and other ones on slavery, too. Um, but but they were trying to do what they knew was right, but they couldn't quite get there. Now, we, today, people aren't trying to get to where they know they, they, they should get, but they're still very busy canceling other people. You know, I mean, huh. that, that part of it is very popular. <laughs> well, it's so true that um, intense self-accounting uh, sets an extraordinarily high bar. Um, Franklin says in his Virtue on Humility, be perfect like Jesus and Socrates. And of course, Jesus famously said, be, be perfect, or, or the, 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 the book of Mark prescribes people to be perfect, even as Jesus is perfect. So it's extraordinarily hard. You're never going to reach it. And as you say, the founders absolutely fell short on every single measure. The striking thing, though, is not that they fell short, because we all do, but that they knew it. And they're so morally serious. They're They're constantly beating themselves up for both large and small failures, both losing their temper or eating too much. Or I, I love the amazing John Quincy Adams diary entry. He's 27 years old. He's just been appointed to the Supreme Court and turned down a Supreme Court appointment. He's the ambassador to St. Petersburg in Russia. And he says, I haven't achieved anything. I'm wasting all my time. I'm spending too much time at the theater. I'm getting... Bad. I'm drinking too much. You know, if I just could find a little bit more self-discipline, I might make something of myself. And those of us, who, you know, those of us who have, have Jewish mothers know the exact same. <laughs> <laughs> he, had Ab- he had Abigail Adams for a mother, who's basically a uber, uh, you know, Puritan mother, who's constantly right. telling him, "Master your unreasonable passions." You know, there's temptations lurking everywhere. You you must. Over overcome, you must make something of yourself. So it's 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 a lot of pressure, but um, and it can have uh, emotional costs. Adams's son, right? John Quincy Adams would write these letters to his son, exhorting him to live up to the ideals of the Bible, and it was just too much for the son, who became an alcoholic and, and committed suicide. Which yeah, just dev- devastated Adams. So there, there's certainly, you know, it's not an easy injunction to engage in self-reflection and try to improve yourself constantly but but it's um very motivating and and again what's so striking is how central this was to the american idea or and the american ideal for so long frederick Douglass has that 
great speech, Self-Reliance, which was his most popular speech after the Civil War. And he invokes John Quincy Adams and he invokes the ancient wisdom and says we all have both the right but the duty to improve ourselves. And then it, Emerson calls it the American idea, uh, liberation. And uh, Tocqueville talks about it as self-interest properly understood. And Louis Brandeis inscribes it into the US reports uh, by talking about freedom of conscience. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg told me her mother told her to over, overcome unproductive emotions like anger, jealousy, and fear. So it, it was really such a central part of American identity for so long. And that makes it all the more remarkable that it's just dropped away. So let's tell a story about your own experience with your own mother, which was like John Adams, because he, he, I think John Adams' mother, if I have the right founder, told him uh, about boredom, how to deal with boredom, and you said it was exactly what your mother said. So why don't you? Thank you for, for noticing that. I've never forgotten her advice. She said, if you're bored, it's your own fault. <laughs> and you know, it, it seemed a little daunting for a, <laughs> a kid, but, and this is, this is before the, um, before social media and stuff. I wonder if any kids even feel that sense of what am I going to do now that you can browse? But um, that's what my mom told me. And it was it was Jefferson who told his daughter exactly the same advice. If you're if you're bored, it's your own fault. And, and he was big on reading as the best antidote to boredom. Uh, my mother, when I was nine years old, uh, I'm one of uh, 12 children. And uh, I, I said to her one day, I'm I'm bored. And she said, oh, you should never be bored. I mean, obviously, she wasn't raising all those kids. Uh, but she huh. said, there are a billion things to do. Just pick one. Oh. <laughs> that was it. And you know, I haven't been bored since then. Uh, no, it's just it's the it, it works. It, that, that, that one's one of the easier ones to not be bored. You know, yeah. some of the other uh, standards are a little bit harder to keep up. But, but not being bored in this world is, is uh, fairly easy, actually. So true. And, and the Adamses were so keen on reading as the antidote. And the dad, John, John Adams, said, you're never alone when you have a poet in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And I love that advice as well. Yeah, it's it, thinking of reading as a conversation with another mind. And then you, mm -hmm. you ask yourself, I mean, this is kind of an old fashioned way of looking at it, but you ask yourself, do I want to spend time with that mind or not? And, mm -hmm. you know, what, what quality is the mind? You know, that kind of thing. And, and of course, the, these classical writers appeal to at least a certain kind of mind of, oh, I'd love to have a friend that was like that or thought like that or even half like that. And so they spend the time with, with those writers. And I, I think it's the way all great minds that are working on this project of trying to create civilization, how they reach mm -hmm. each other across time and space. You know, they write these books and, and this is how they have conversations in their minds with other minds like that. And then, of course, if they're good at it, it works. What a beautiful way to put it. It is a conversation across the centuries with great minds with whom you want to converse. Emerson said, a friend is someone before whom I can think aloud. And when you're in conversation with a great book, it is like a friend in that best sense. And I have to say, since you're doing such great work to spark interest in the humanities and reading, and of course, all the wonderful Commonwealth Club mem members are, are readers and you're all lifelong learners. Mm -hmm. And if there's any ray of light to the polarization and brutality and speed of our social media age, which is so much the antithesis of, of the kind of deep reading that the founders had in mind. It's the fact that all of the books in the world are now online. Mm -hmm. And it just blows my mind that I was able to both do a year of reading for this book and then a year of writing just sitting on my couch. And I had their free copies of all the greatest literature of all time. And uh, I can actually read the physical copies the founders read if I want to read their marginalia. And I, and I say in the book that I was so full of wonder when, when I was a kid. And I went to the Library of Congress with my mom. And the Thomas Jefferson Building, for those of you who haven't been and are going to Washington, I think is the most beautiful and inspiring building in all of Washington, DC. And I was so filled with wonder at the thought that all the books in the world were in that building. Well, now, now they're just on my cell phone. Mm -hmm. And all I need all I needed to do is to find the discipline to read them. Mm. And, and for me, that was that was habits. And I got that from the founders inspired by Jefferson's reading list or or Pythagoras or Adams. If those those men and women, all the great women, Abigail Adams, John, um, Mercy Otis Warren, Phyllis Wheatley, who, who read these books, were deep readers, too. If they could find time to read in the middle of everything they were doing, 
I could too. So I did it in the morning for, for two hours and you can do it whenever you want. And the, and the simple uh, takeaway that I now have, I'm not allowed to browse in the morning. I wake up and I've just got to read and I can't check email or browse. I've got to read mm -hmm. some book. And it's just, it's life changing. And it comes from the founders. For those who uh, despair about the future of the human race, which is not that hard to do at times, uh, you know, watching politics or whatever, or the amount of time spent on TikTok or whatever, because, uh, you know, a lot of kids spend a lot of time on comic books before, so it's, it's just a, a change of form. But I think if you think about all the children in all the villages of the planet, and, and the, they're now going to have access to everything. They only need to have one teacher, one one person tell them, hey, you know, you might like this kind of stuff. And everywhere, every, every place, they're going to have access to this thing for free, basically for free. And, uh, you know, they might not be able to go to college, might, but I think it will have a big impact on the civilization of, of humanity in the next hundred years that this is all available. You, you put it so beautifully. What a, yeah. what a lovely way to imagine all the children. Oh, it's so moving. All the children in the world having access to great teachers for free. And I, I have to put in a plug for the amazing resources we have at the National Constitution Center, where we've mm -hmm. put free and online a Constitution 101 course with primary sources and links to the, the great primary text that inspire the founders and the greatest scholars, liberal and conservative, debating every clause. And we have a great partnership with Khan Academy, where we're going to launch next fall with Khan's first uh, civics and Constitution 101 class. And just think of all the kids we're going to be able to reach with that wonderful resource. So it's it's a marvelous, empowering technology. But, or and, I want to say mm. great videos and great podcasts and great teachers are, are no substitute for actual deep reading. We've got to inspire our kids and ourselves. And it's just, let's begin with each of us, because this is for lifelong learners. It's not only for kids. But uh, we have to practice and inspire others with deep daily reading of books. And maybe just to take one step further, good books, as you said, in, in conversation with great minds and with our friends across the centuries. I'm a huge apostle or evangelist, I'll say evangelist mm -hmm. rather than apostle, um, for primary texts. And it was just transformative for me to be able to go back and read the actual text that inspire the founders, not, not secondary literature. And that's why we've put online at the NCC, Frederick Douglass and Mercy Otis Warren and Ida B. Wells and Emerson and you know just the actual primary texts because it just is so, um, so that people can think as they will and speak as they think and make up their own minds. And in this extraordinarily uh, challenging age where the very enlightenment idea of truth and reason is being challenged mm -hmm. by social media, by, you know, AI, of course, is just a whole new frontier of a, a challenge to truth. It's very important that everyone go back to the primary texts and make up their own minds. And, and to see why those people became famous, there's a reason. And it's perfectly obvious when you read their books. Um, and regardless of what mistakes they made in their pursuits or, or what things look like mistakes to us now. There are, there are things that we're doing now that will look like mistakes to the future for, for no, you know, no question about it. So um, I think that that's another element to it. But let's, let's talk about, so from the Constitution Center, let's just do one thing about the Constitution because it's something that people bring up all the time. That's the three-fifths clause. Okay? Now I've heard a lot of different ways of explaining the three-fifths clause some of them completely derogatory, some completely you know, in its favor. Well, I'm very curious at the National Constitution Center what you think of this clause and why it came about so that people can understand it wasn't just a, a derogatory statement against slaves. That's not how it started. It, 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 uh, that's right. Um, it was a political compromise to prevent the enslaving states from having an even greater slavery bonus than they already did. Imagine you, you, you can have an enslaved population, you deny them freedom and all political rights, and yet you get to count them for the purposes of congressional representation, and then the enslaving states have all the political power. That's obviously not fair. So 
um, they took the three-fifths formula from the Northwest Ordinance, which had been drafted to come up with a fair apportionment system for the development of Western lands. And that was the um, compromise. It wasn't either an endorsement of slavery or a repudiation of slavery. It was a recognition that as long as slavery existed, then it couldn't be right to count slaves for purposes of representation since they weren't represented, they were enslaved. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, um, it's, it's striking, it, you know, of course it's a large topic, was it or was it not a pro-slavery document? Well, Frederick Douglass, first of all, is so inspired by the classical learning that he got from the Colombian orator that he becomes the greatest abolitionist of his time. And he insists that slavery is inconsistent with the natural rights articulated in the Declaration of Independence and resolves to efface slavery. When Douglas reads Madison's notes, which are published in 1840 for the first time, and sees Madison say that the convention intentionally refused explicitly to endorse the idea that there could be property in men, he said that changed his conception of himself as a man and a citizen. Having once thought the Constitution was a pro-slavery document, Douglas came to believe it was a glorious liberty document, and it was a libel on the founders to uh, claim that they had explicitly endorsed slavery since they'd done, done no such thing, and they should be held to account and live up to their best ideals. So that's, that's just one of the insights that classical uh, moral philosophy gave Douglas and it helped him become the greatest abolitionist of his time. Yeah, and it's it's interesting that the, the conversation about this just keeps coming back to the same thing over and over again. Uh, you know that there's we don't rest. We end up with the same argument against the same argument for. I heard one argument that I thought was very interesting that it, it, at three fifths because it gave them less. If they had freed their slaves, they would have had more power, right? They would have, they would have gotten higher representation for their states if they had freed their slaves. So. In, in one sense, you could think of it as even an incentive to free your slaves. Obviously, not an, ins an insufficient incentive, obviously, but still. It, it, it's, it's remarkable how much slavery got entrenched after the Constitution. It really was during the Jacksonian era that the enslavers stopped recognizing that slavery was inconsistent with the natural rights of the Declaration and began insisting that it was justified by God's law in really disgraceful ways. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, you mentioned the hypocrisy of the founders, and I was just struck by how far from denying the inconsistency of slavery with justice and natural rights, all of the enslaving founders from Virginia acknowledged it, some much more than others. I have that amazing quote that I found from Patrick Henry, who said, is it not amazing that I myself, who believe slavery is immoral, myself own slaves? I will not justify it. I won't attempt to. It's simple avarice or greed. I can't do with the inconvenience of living without uh, slavery. Mm. And that idea, he's putting it in kind of classical terms, frugality and industry are the virtues avarice and greed are the greatest vices, and he's just too greedy to give up the comforts of the enslaving system. Jefferson said the exact same thing. He usually projected his own guilt on others and accused South Carolina and Georgia of avarice mm -hmm. in refusing to give up the international slave trade until 1808, because they didn't need to import more slaves, unlike, or they did, they, they thought that they did, unlike Virginia, which felt that um, it didn't need more. But um, Jefferson, uh, in some ways comes off worse, I thought, than I recognized before viewing him through mm -hmm. the terms of moral uh, philosophy, because he was so compartmentalized and kept insisting that slavery had to end at some point in the distant future, but then the day always kept receding. Also, the, the degree of his racism was really striking, even by the standards of the enslaving founders, and his denigrating the talents of Phyllis Wheatley, the, the genius mm -hmm. who Washington and, and the world recognized as a great poet just because he felt black people couldn't be as good as white people because they were inferior is, is, is shocking. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the fact that he's surrounded uh, in Monticello by his own children, who he calls servants, mm -hmm. and he frees them on his death, keeping a promise that he made to Sally Hemings in Paris. Uh, he frees two of his children on his death, having previously freed two others. But all the rest of his enslaved population is sold. Uh, children are separated from their parents in order to pay off Jefferson's own 
crushing debts because he was so extraordinarily uh, unfrugal. He lived, he lived beyond his means. He was unfrugal. He, yeah. I call him an aestheticized shopaholic. I mean, he just couldn't stop spending on on the luxuries of Monticello, so at odds with his stated devotion to democracy and simplicity and and republican asceticism and 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 you know and he's constantly saying that one generation can't impose debts on another and that's why he wants a constitutional convention every 19 years because the earth is held in usufruct to the living and he seems to suggest that any public debt might itself be unconstitutional and then he passes along this crushing debt to his own kids so he, he's a figure of deep contradictions um but it is highly significant that he, he he never attempted in his lifetime to justify the morality of slavery. He just couldn't be bothered with the inconvenience of giving it up. Do you think that this is, this is an aside, but do you think that Jefferson's uh, being against the central bank had to do with the fact that he was a debtor? I mean, it's, such, it's such a great question. So my next book, which I'm really excited about and in the thick of, is how the debate between Hamilton and Jefferson over the bank and federal power defined all of our subsequent political and constitutional debates for all of American history. Mm -hmm. And it really is amazing how central that debate over the bank was. They, they have it in constitutional terms. Does Congress have the power to charter a bank? And that gives rise to the debate between strict construction championed by Jefferson and liberal construction by Hamilton that we're seeing playing out on the Supreme Court today. But the answer is, it, yes, it, it it may have. I mean, his he was his incredible opposition to taking on any public debt, even though um, you know, in economics at the time said that it was the sensible thing to do, was ideological, and the ideology may well have been rooted in his own pocketbook. Well, we look forward to interviewing you about that book when it's done, so uh, we'll get all the more details. Um, but we can't we can't skip George Washington. Um, so let's talk a little bit about George Washington because he was sort of like the unanimous idea of who should be the president because he kind of lived up to these rules that they were all trying to in their self-discipline the most. But he had his own issues. Um, but, you know, if you get 90% uh, a 90 grade, you still beat all the people who are at 80 and 75 and so on and so forth. So, so why don't you say how everybody else viewed him and why? because that, that seemed to be part of that common culture. It was remarkable. He was the most self-mastered man of all. He, he had a fierce temper, but he struggled mightily to control it. Mm. And all, there were only a few times in his whole life when anyone ever saw him lose his temper in public. And that calm self-mastery was such a remarkable moment at Newburgh, where there's an army rebellion and mm -hmm. people are about to rise up against him because they're not getting paid and they're angry at Congress for not paying their salaries. And Washington gets up on the temple of virtue, as it's called. He's, he's so self-conscious about this classical heritage. And theatrically, he pulls out a speech to read and then he struggles and puts on his reading glasses and says, forgive me, I've grown old in the service of my country and now I'm growing blind. And it's so unaffected and human that the soldiers weep. And they've never seen him so great as at this moment. He's, he's showing some humanity, but in the, in the most self-controlled way. I, I, um, there's a great debate in, in Henry Adams's democracy about whether Washington was great or whether he was a paper hero, whether mm. you know, he was over -headed. And um, it, the debaters say, nothing less than the meaning of America is at stake. Viewed through the classical moral philosophy that he read as a kid, I, I now understand why everyone saw he was so great, because that's the ideal. Mm -hmm. The self-mastered, tranquil man of whom Cicero speaks, great in his in his self-control, never showing unreasonable passions and emotions like anger, but but being perfectly composed is the definition of leadership. And he demonstrates that by, of course, leaving office, the fact that mm -hmm. he went back after two terms, like Cincinnati, the, the farmer going back to his plows, uh, shocked King George, uh, the, the, uh, King George, who said he could have been the greatest, you know, emperor in the world. But, mm -hmm. but, but then George said, if he gives up the office, he'll be even greater. And, and he did. Right. Um, it was also interesting to see that 
Washington may have had mommy issues as well, of course. You know, so. <laughs> what our what our relationship with our parents was but his mom was nagged him and was critical highly hyper critical of him mm. and he bristled at it he would write her kind of pet uh, grieved letters um responding to her unreasonable requests ron Chernow, in his great biography speculates that some of washington's self-command may have been an effort to stop losing his temper with his mom uh and deal with her hyper criticism. But um, regardless of the psychological source, we know where the intellectual and moral source came. It came from these books. He, he read mm-hmm. Seneca, he read The Spectator magazine. He, he just imbued all this. So all, it's, it, it was highly inspiring to, for me to see how everyone recognized that it was his emotional self-control that was the source of his greatness. Jefferson said the greatest quality in his temperament was prudence. He would listen to all sides and deliberate slowly before making up his own mind and silence he at the constitutional convention he says very little almost nothing it's just the simple fact of his showing up and presiding with this calm majestic impartiality that's the source of his power plus the fact that everyone knows he'll be the first president and then the fact that he leaves office he is a walking monument to the classical virtues and he inspired a nation as a result and as Mommy issues. I sure hope you didn't, she didn't give him too much trouble about that cherry tree that he chopped down. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know he didn't. That's from Parson Wings, yeah, which is exactly. treacly biography. Although I, it is kind of fun to read him and just kind of puffs him up, but he probably didn't chop down the cherry tree. No, yeah, um, that was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a few uh, questions coming in from our audience. I just thought I'd remind our audience, uh, uh, online audience right now, if you'd like to ask uh, Jeff Rosen a question about... Uh, his book, uh, you can just send it, put it in the chat room and I'll, I'll ask you these and then we'll go back to our conversation. So uh, one question, what is the biggest threat facing democracy? A little easy question for you, softball. <laughs> well, the greatest threat is, is, is demagogues. I can say that, you know, the National Constitution Center is nonpartisan, yeah. so I'm not allowed to have any political opinions whatsoever, but I can <laughs> say historically that what the founders most fear is a demagogue who will flatter the people, whip up a faction and foment disunion. There's an amazing series of letters from Hamilton and Jefferson. Hamilton writes to George Washington in 1792 that a man unscrupulous in temper, extravagant in his habits, um, who flatters the people for personal ambition will sow the whirlwind. And then I found this letter from Jefferson uh, where Madison sends him a copy of the Constitution for the first time, and Jefferson says, I've got two objections. One is there's no Bill of Rights, and two, I'm concerned that because the president can run for re-election, in the future we may have a president who flatters the people, loses by a few votes, cries foul, enlists the states who voted for him, refuses to leave, leave office, and installs himself as a dictator. I mean, it's just amazing. Mm. Um, and, and the whole system is set up to avoid demagogues and to slow down deliberation and to prevent factious mobs from mobilizing and hopes that because the country's so big and it's hard for mobs to discover each other, by the time an insurrectionist mob actually you know, starts to do its worst, they'll, they'll get tired and go home. Uh, and in that sense, January 6th was their nightmare. It's just a nonpartisan statement because they warned so repeatedly about demagogues who would stir up insurrection and refuse to leave office. And it's a grave threat to the Republic. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, because it's been gone so long, people, and they have all the remains of the Electoral College, and people don't know why that's in the way anymore. Um, they don't understand that because the founders were worried about this, the senators were appointed by the state legislatures and the state uh, and then the state legislatures the senators then voted for the president so there, there was no direct election either of senators or presidents when it started and and uh, uh john quincy adams was one of the presidents that i mean there was an election but but it had to be chosen he had to be chosen by the congress um so it, it, it was a different world that they were setting up um and Obviously, they were not able to hold that back from our democracy, and I think that's probably a good thing. But there should be some other checks and balances on the on the uh, 
on the voting so that we know that this kind of approach doesn't create the same problem. You know? Very well said. It's, um, th they were concerned about the excesses of democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd become more democratic in ways they couldn't have imagined most significantly through media technologies. It wasn't until the invention of the radio that presidents could reach the whole country quickly mm -hmm. um, and immediately and come into their homes and you know say my friends as FDR did and social media of course is just the, the founder's nightmare it's enraged to engage and all the slow speed bumps and roadblocks are are gone so how to resurrect that is a really serious technological and constitutional challenge but the system is not set up to have direct uh, democracy uh, at plus polarization because the founders thought that would lead to demagogues. So here's a, a good question for you from someone in the audience. If you had an opportunity to ask anyone featured in your book one question, what would that question be? And or what, which person, who would that be? And what would you ask them? You ask lots of good questions in the book. I don't know how you're going to narrow them down to one, but... I, I'm, I, in some ways, I'm most drawn to John Quincy Adams. He, he mm -hmm. just embodied the quest more mindfully than anyone else. And I really am struck by his poetry. He kind of dismissed it as not great, but he would wake up and dawn and write sonnets mm -hmm. of virtue. And there's an anti-slavery sonnet that's very beautiful, I think. Um, and he said that if he could have achieved anything, it would have been to be a, a, a literary figure, a, a poet and a, a writer, um, that that was his greatest pleasure. So I, I don't know, I think I'd ask him what his favorite poem was. I'd just love to talk about uh, poetry with the great John Quincy Adams. Let's tell a little bit of his story. Sorry, he's the son of a president. So he, just like John F. Kennedy, kind of went around with his dad when he was young and got to meet people in Europe and, and so on. So he, he was, as a teenager and even in his early 20s, he hobnobbed with, with uh, leadership. Um, and then he got all these positions. Then he got to be president, and then he lost. And he got to be president in an unusual election. And then he went back into the Congress and fought against slavery. And you know, I, I assume that there's no other presidents that went back to being congressmen afterwards. And it seemed to me that, that, that one of the ideas that I have about how we could fix things a little bit is, is to you know, have the president and the vice president that when they, once they've finished their first term become senators at large. And in, in any election, uh, the one who comes in second, president and vice president, also becomes senators at large. So you'd have four senators at large in general. And therefore, the, you, you, I think it would just change the way that the debates would take place because you would know that your main opponent is going to be extremely influential in the Senate later on. What a great idea. And engaging former presidents in Congress, as you say, is, is there's no better example than John Quincy Adams. What a story. What a story. He, mm -hmm. he loses the election of uh, 1828 to Jackson. I mean, he's twice lost the popular vote, but, it, but the, the first time the House gives him the election and the second time Jackson gets it. His, his son's committed suicide. He feels like he's a complete political failure. He's made a total hash of his life, despite his extraordinary achievements. And then he finds new purpose in the battle to end slavery. Mm -hmm. And his commitment to end slavery is both the result of his reflection and his reading in classical philosophy and in the Bible. And he comes up with an original interpretation of a verse from the Bible, which says that Jesus shall free all the captives. And he sees this as a prophecy of the end of slavery. And he denounces the gag rule, which prohibits abolitionists from pet petitions for being introduced in Congress. And he defends the First Amendment and famously says, am I gagged? Am I gagged? And he is so devoted to abolitionism that Frederick Douglass later praises him as the greatest apostle of freedom in the Congress. And then he casts his last vote as an old man against the Mexican War. He says no. And then he collapses on a sofa in Congress. And as he's carried away um, and uh, he's heard to murmur I am composed and he's got this from Cicero which is his mm. favorite author and 
who always inspired him that perfect composure at the time of death and in the face of grief is the mark of the wise man. It, you just can't uh, imagine greater self-mastery than that and, and greater uh, success in approximating the virtuous perfection that his parents had told him to pursue. Yeah, and it's like a family trait. I mean, it's, it, that family it was extremely influential for the next couple of generations as well. So there are at least four generations through Henry from, from uh, the first president. Um, and it's, it's interesting because John Adams, the, the first president, I mean, third president, but the first in that family that was president, um, he wrote something very simple, but, but still very, very profound. And he said that, well, death, of course, comes for everybody, but he said, either, either I'm dead and I, I won't know it, <laughs> or I'm still living. So why should I be afraid of that? Well, it's really, really, I mean, that's a very s simple argument, but it, it, people, people keep forgetting it all the time. And I'm so glad you, you found that. Um, and he gets that from the Stoics. Mm -hmm. And out, out Phoenix, out, uh, you know, either either it's an end or it's a um, the beginning of the afterlife mm -hmm. is, is an incredibly consoling thought. And the idea of Adams uh, trading that axiom as well as the uh, ancient axiom about the immobile consistency of the tranquil mind that he copied out as a school kid, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, just shows the extreme power of this moral framework um, that all of the Adams practiced throughout their life. And interesting that they, you know, as you said about John Adams, he was so vain and, and he was the one that, you know, in spite of the fact that he's doing this, he was the one that tried to stop newspapers from writing bad things about him. And, you know, he, he, he didn't behave very much like a, a democratic uh, president. Of course, there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, precedent yet, but still. <laughs> he really didn't. And, and the Alien and Sedition Acts are the great uh, shame of the early republic that they um, led to the civil liberties reaction of Jefferson and Madison. Uh, and to their Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, which asserted the ability of states to refuse to nullify unconstitutional laws. But um, Adams um, went much too far at that moment. But the thing about Adams, I, I find him incredibly endearing anyway, because he wore his heart on his sleeve and he knew it. He knew about his excesses. He recognized that he was vain and he made up with his an antagonists, including Mercy Otis Warren and Jefferson, initially both uh, were great friends. They fell out over politics, and then they make up, and they have this beautiful uh, friendship and exchange of epistolary letters when they're older. So, um, you know, he may not have a musical written about him, but but Adam is <laughs> a very endearing figure. I think you have to die in a duel for that. <laughs> Reason that Hamilton got the musical, he was, he yeah. was the most ungoverned in his passions, but he didn't make up and, and didn't really have the self-awareness to recognize it. Yeah, Aaron Burr would probably not get much of a musical himself if he hadn't been oh. <laughs> <laughs> remembered for the guy who shot him. But um, why don't you say a little bit more about the Adams-Jefferson thing? Because it's a really a, a, a very touching story and it's a known story, but I think a lot of people still don't know it. And, and the fact that they died on the same day and that the day was a July 4th, an anniversary, and it, and it was a big anniversary. It was the 50th anniversary, right? 26? The 50th anniversary, I mean, you call it willpower or divine providence, but yeah. they died They died within hours of each other, and they knew it. Um, they, they would kind of ask, you know, are we at the fourth yet, or is, is it the fourth? And then as they're both dying on, on July 4th, 1826, um, Adams's last words are, Jefferson still lives, and he's wrong. Jefferson has expired just a few hours earlier, but the, the two yeah. great patriots uh, pass at the same time. And and the the initial precipitant for their reconciliation is a book of classical philosophy. Adams sends Jefferson as a present, a book of homespun, as he calls it, which is a, a book that his son, John Quincy, has just written as the Boylston professor of rhetoric at Harvard um, about the importance of mastering your passions and oratory. And Jefferson likes it, and that begins the 
correspondence. As, as, as you said, I, I found it most amazing that the thing they talked about more frequently than anything else was comparative religion and that they were so broadly read and so deeply reflective of their own spirituality. And after Adams expresses excitement that the um, discovery of the Gita will show the influence on Pythagoras, Adams says to Jefferson that his entire faith on reflection after a lifetime of living can be summed up in the hymn of Pleonth, which is essentially love God and all his creatures. And then um, Adams sums that up even more succinctly to rejoice in all things. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's beautiful and true and um, deeply spiritual and the antithesis of the dogmatic Puritanism that he bristled at as a kid. Mm -hmm. And it's just a lifetime of, of spiritual growth. And, and Jefferson is equally reflective about his own spirituality. And he finds his final consolation in the Epicureans. And he says the Epicureans have been libeled as a kind of pleasure seekers. They're, they're all about the mm. contraction desires so that, so that we can rationally meet them. And he says, I, you know, Epicurean, um, indolent or contented in mind and body, and, and sets up that understanding. Um, Jefferson is not um, at all an atheist, and he embraces Jesus as the greatest moral authority of all times, and mm. famously goes through the Bible and takes out the superstitions and miracles so you can get the essence of Jesus's moral teachings. Um, I was struck that he clearly believes in an afterlife, even though um, he was his enemy suggested that he didn't. Uh, he called himself a Unitarian also at the end of his life, but he has a sense of the same uh, unity of the divine that Adams did, that Franklin did, that uh, Washington, and that um, all the ancient philosophy does, because the ancient wisdom is a spiritual quest. It uh, says that we have a divine duty to live in accordance with reason, which is truth, which is unity, which is God. So all of the religious divisions of the founders' time, the terrible sectarian wars mm -hmm. about ritual, uh, were ones that they viewed as leading to faction. They thought that religious differences were the greatest source of faction, along with you know uh, politics. And it was just interesting to see how candidly they talked about their own spirituality, and their spirituality was deep. But for many of them, and some were more conventional Christians than others, mm -hmm. um, it, it was not primarily rooted in an established church. It was and it was deeply informed by their reading. And in that sense, they were, as we began by saying, uh, great um, defenders of the similarities among the Eastern and Western wisdom traditions. Yeah, and it, of course, people uh, overlook the fact that a lot of those same traditions, the ones that are older than Christianity, are, are the source of a lot of ideas in early Christianity as well. So it, it, there was no conflict seemingly I mean there was there was a theological conflict about about exactly what your uh, list of beliefs are but the basic approach to life was taken from the same thing the same ideas that's a crucially important point this is not an either or were the founders right. devoted to the classics or were they Christian that's a completely false antithesis totally rebuked and undermined by looking at the primary sources mm -hmm. all of the Christian sources including the so-called reasonable Christian divines, reasonable meaning of just a term of art for those thinkers who were trying to reconcile faith with reason in, during the time of the Enlightenment, like John Locke, like Tillotson, like Willitson, all of whom used the phrase, the pursuit of happiness. They, they were all Christian, but they insisted that uh, to live in accordance with reason is to live in accordance with the divine. And these truths are self-evident and can be apprehended by a reasoning mind without um, supernatural intervention. And all of these Christian sources cite, Sto cite Cicero and cite Pythagoras, and they cite the, the ancient sources. So it's a, it's a, it's a syncretic, eclectic um, tradition where they're all feeding off of each other. And um, for them, spirituality and reason were entirely compatible. 
you know, just going back to the story about Jefferson and Adams dying on the same day, the 50th anniversary, it, it reminded me of a rather dramatic version of, of what does happen quite often if a parent is dying and, and uh, they have three children and two of the children have already come home and there's a third one coming but hasn't arrived yet and they're really kind of dying. And they, a lot of times they hold on for another 20 hours or so on. The third child comes, they say goodbye, and then they die, like, within minutes. So it seemed, it seemed like you said, about something about willpower or whatever. But for them to both die on the day that, that, that was the 50th anniversary of the, of the uh, Declaration of Independence was, is pretty astounding. But because he has a musical, we haven't talked about him, but let's talk a little bit about Hamilton. <laughs> so, so we'll finish up with Hamilton. We have a few minutes left. Um, never president. We know why, because of the musical. <laughs> but, but somebody also that had, had uh, you know, extreme influence on lots of, of, of the other founders, especially George Washington, and, and was also immersed in the same sort of learning in spite of the fact that he grew up poor on a small island before he came to New York, et cetera. So. Exactly right. Um, he's so influenced by his upbringing. He grows up on the small island. He's definitely, um, uh, you know, the famous uh, bastard son of a whore, as Adams uh, puts it uh, so, so cruelly. Um, there, there's a book that came out after the musical suggesting he may have even have been Jewish because his mom, may, her first husband was almost certainly Jewish. She may have converted to marry him and Hamilton did go to a Jewish school, which he might have only been able to do if, he, if his mother was a Jewish convert. But regardless of that, he through his uh, complete determination to write himself off the island, as Ron Chernow says, which inspired mm -hmm. the musical, just reads the classics, which he, his mother has in her little grocery and reads Plutarch and gets a scholarship and goes to America and then goes to Columbia and reads more classics and is fired with the ambition to inscribe his name on the world. And he views it in classical terms. The greatest, the noblest ambition for the classical people was fame, justified, not, not celebrity or not power, but justified fame for having served your country. So he says that when he's a kid, I wish there were a war, dear Nettie. He just mm. wants to make his name on the battlefield and he gets his wish, the war comes, he becomes Washington's closest aide, and then he develops his devotion to union and his commitment to a strong central government that will constrain the states and will ensure the economic vitality of all uh, defines his economic program and the basis of his economic program of a national bank and a system of public credit and assuming the debts of the states are all based on his reading of David Hume and of Scottish thinkers who say that an international economy will benefit all. And Hamilton's letter on the bank is, as we were discussing, defending broad congressional power to do anything that is appropriate to its enumerated powers um, is one that Chief Justice John Marshall inscribes in the McCulloch and Maryland case, which upholds the bank and becomes the basis for broad construction of national power for the rest of US history. So Hamilton's huge, big ideas are a strong presidency, a strong Congress, a strong economy, and a strong military, all to uh, increase the good of all. And he sees no necessary antithesis between liberty and power, as Jefferson does, mm -hmm. and thinks, in fact, that it's in our union that we will thrive. Contrast that with Jefferson's big ideals, which are not national power, but states' rights, not liberal construction, but strict construction, uh, not uh, security and order, but liberty, and not the broadest um, political uh, community represented as a republic, but instead democracy. So, um, for all those and and that, for all those reasons, that's why the the Hamilton Jefferson debate defines America. And it's what's so exciting to see it play out is that different sides throughout American history invoke either Jefferson or Hamilton, depending on who's up and who's down, because their stock rises and falls throughout history. And sometimes they'll invoke both characters on both sides of the same question. But that basic antithesis 
has defined not only our debates on the Supreme Court, but also in our political parties ever since the founding. Yeah, it's very interesting because Hamilton and Jefferson are very much like the rural urban divide. You know, who's your who who's your your goal? What's your goal? Your goal is small rural farmers who are the salt of the earth, and they're they're what makes us an honest. Or big cities uh, with huge economy and all that kind of stuff, which gives us the strength to keep our freedom from other people because other people will just run us over. Um, should be an interesting book that you're going to write. Thank you. That, that, that's a central point that you make. Yeah. Absolutely. The urban-rural divide, you know, is, is from the beginning. And then Jefferson has this romantic, almost uh, you know, completely mystic vision of rural shires and woods, which he traces back to ancient Saxon times and thinks that only small-scale agrarian democracy, where people are directly represented and basically in, in town meetings, is is the ideal and hamilton is the defender of the cities and of um immigrants and of urban manufacturers and um that interest urban rural manufacturer versus agriculture is the initial division between the political parties of the jeffersonian republicans and the old federalists and and then their commitment to national power versus states rights initially tracks that divide until it becomes convenient and they switch sides. And in the progressive era, the Democrats start using uh, what Herbert Crowley famously called Hamiltonian means for Jeffersonian ends, extending <laughs> a big government for the goal of economic equality and so forth. So it's 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 both um, uh, inspiring to see that these are essentially debates of principle mm -hmm. on the Supreme Court and the politics, but also sobering about how political they are and the Supreme Court battles that play out strict construction versus loose construction really track the political parties um, that appointed them. And in that sense, the distinction between law and politics is not always obvious. Yeah, you know, being a law professor, it just showed. <laughs> oh, sorry, I can't help. I can't help. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> At least I promise not to call on anyone in the audience. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can't see them. You don't want to be Professor Kingsley, huh? No, Del God. You come here with a skull full of mush. <laughs> you leave thinking like a lawyer. <laughs> Great 1978 version of it, if anyone wants to find it on YouTube. But it'll keep you out of law school, I can assure you. Well, I hope our, our online audience just walked away with a lot more discipline. <laughs> <laughs> you did a good job without really giving it to them. So uh, thank you very much, Jeffrey, uh, for you know, sharing the ideas in your book, uh, The Pursuit of Happiness and what it meant to the founders and how the classical writers influenced that. And we do look forward to that next book. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club and it's now 122nd year of enlightened discussion. Thanks a lot for joining us. <laughs>